Aloha mai kako. My name is Morgan. I'm one of the volunteer coordinators for the Citizen Forester Program. In this video, we're going to be covering some of the basic information that you'll need to start your journey as a citizen forester. So let's hop in. So this video is just an introduction to the Citizen Forester Program. By the end of this video, by no means are you expected to be an expert citizen forester just yet. Uh, most of the learning you'll experience out in the field when you get your hands dirty and start hugging some trees. So to get started, we'll cover some background information about the program. Again, I'm Morgan. I'm the volunteer coordinator on Oahu. Next up, we have our executive director, Wei Li, who oversees all of the program um, activities. Next, we have Sari. She is our volunteer coordinator on the island of Kauai. And then we have Teddy, who is our volunteer coordinator on Guam. So the Citizen Forester Program is a collective project that involves um, several different partners at many different levels um, of government and different organizations as well. So the program gets its funding um, through the US Forest Service at a federal level. We are supported on the state level here in Hawaii through the Department of Forestry and Wildlife and the Ka'ulunani the state's urban community forestry program. The county of Kauai and the division of urban forestry on uh, in Honolulu are also one of our main partners as they are who is using the information that we are collecting for the street inventory. And same with Guam, Guam is involved through the Department of Agriculture and the division of forestry. And they also are implementing the information used in this inventory into their forestry management as well. And then Smart Tree Specific comes in as we are the nonprofit that manages and oversees this program. So why is this work important? What are we even doing this for? But before we get into why of what we're doing, what is even an urban forest? When you think of urban, you think cities, where people live. When you think forest, you might think something completely opposite, where you have tons of trees growing, but Urban environments have forests as well. Um, it kind of boils down to any type of ecosystem that exists in, in an urban environment. So when we talk about our urban forest, we're looking at the vegetation, water, soil, everything that gets put into play in that ecosystem. So trees provide a variety of vital benefits that we need to live in a healthy environment. They boil down to ecological, economic, cultural, and health benefits. Here are a few examples that you can find in uh, your training manual as well. Trees, besides offering up the oxygen that we need to survive, also create benefits such as increasing property value, um, mitigating stormwater runoff, helping to boost traffic, um, foot traffic for businesses, which can help improve uh, profits. They create habitats for wildlife, create jobs, and so many more. So take a look through here and see what kind of benefits that trees provide that you might not have been familiar with before. So what is happening to our urban tree canopies? If you had to guess, we would hope that they would be staying the same, but unfortunately, or growing, um, but unfortunately they are decreasing in size across the world. Um, every year we're losing trees across the nation. So this is a quick little overview on where you can see that happening the most. Um, but in a quick overglance, the point of this image is to show that trees are losing canopy across the nation, um, kind of at different rates, but all across the, um, the rate of change is negative. So we're looking at um, a loss in tree canopy across the US. So what can we do about that? Let's take a look. There are several things that we can do. One would be to plant more trees. Let's grow that urban canopy. Two, we can create stronger policies. Part of the Citizen Forester Program is creating tree advocates who can advocate for defending our trees and protecting the, the canopy that we already have. And you can do that by stronger policy and protecting the trees and for enforcing uh, policy for planting more trees. So write your representatives. Also, you can join this program and help us create an accurate inventory for all of our city trees. So the Citizen Forester Program was created with two main objectives in mind. One, to develop an urban tree inventory with using community members and citizen science. 
and also to help to increase the community's opinions on trees by helping to spread awareness about how important our urban forests are. And we do that by training, educating, and certifying our community members. Okay, so why a tree inventory? Well, it's hard to manage something that you have without knowing really what it is that you have. So managing an urban forest is not gonna be any exception to that rule. And so creating an inventory will let us know what we have so we can know what we wanna do with it. Um, creating an urban tree inventory was identified as one of the top strategies in protecting our urban forests in the Guam and Hawaii's urban forest action plan. And this is really stemming from the fact that there is no formal inventory that exists right now for the management of these trees in this, in this area. This is an example of what urban tree inventories can tell us. So by filtering through the information that we collect, we can see where potential planting sites for trees would be, how many undesirable species that already exist, and hazardous trees that need more maintenance to be able to either be maintained better or that would need to be potentially removed or replaced. So this inventory is gonna show where our trees are located, which ones need attention, where they're needed, and also the benefits that these trees provide. You can check out the inventories that we've already collected for Hawaii and Guam on these links. We will link them into the comment section in the chat as well. So this Citizen Forester program really excels on building community support. Without our community members, this program wouldn't be successful. We need people like you who care about our trees and care about our environments and our communities to be able to advocate for trees and help us collect this information to help manage them. So what is it exactly that we do? We know the Citizen Forester Program is geared towards collecting a tree inventory and advocating for trees, but let's take a look to see exactly what you're gonna be doing when you're volunteering with the Citizen Forester Program. Mainly, the activity that we're gonna be participating in is conducting a tree assessment, which just means how to assess the condition of the tree based on several different measurements that, of data that we're gonna be collecting when we're out in the field. First and foremost, we do wanna strive for accuracy, but we're gonna estimate when it's necessary. Um, safety is always gonna be number one of a concern with the Citizen Forester Program, and sometimes the way trees grows um, accuracy is not always feasible, so we want to use your best judgment when measuring the, um, the assessments of trees. So some of the assessments that we're going to be taking is the crown measurements. And so when I refer to a crown of a tree, I'm talking about the leafy portion of the tree. Um, and this is where we're going to be able to estimate the food gathering potential that each tree has. And so there's a couple of different measurements that we're going to be taking based off of the crown. That's going to be density, so the amount of light that's coming through the trees, the tree's uh, crown. Also, the live crown ratio is going to be the amount of crown compared to the whole tree. And then dieback. Dieback is at the ends of the crown that start to die back because of health issues that might be going on with the tree, but you see little dead ends at the end of the crown. Next up, we're going to take measurements on the diameter of the tree. This is where your tree hugging skills are definitely going to come into play. Um, but here, we're going to take an estimate of the volume of the tree. And this is to kind of see an approximate of the carbon storage and sequestration um, that the tree has capacity for. We'll also be taking measurements on the height of the tree, from the base of the tree all the way to the top. We'll be taking measurements on the condition of the tree, so looking at the overall health and also we take some observations about the location of the tree. So we're gonna be seeing the type of land use that the tree is growing in, the type of growth space, if it's growing um, in a tight concrete square or in a beautiful lush green park. All of those factors play into some of the conditions and um, growth potential for trees. Okay, so let's take a look how to actually map a tree. Okay, primary ID number. Three seven one four nine. This tree is alive. This tree's common name is Cole. Trupo. 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 Number stems one. One stem. DSH. 
eight. Density looks like twenty five fifty. Yep. Ten die back. Uh, ten, 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 ten percent. Fourteen. I'll do land use information. So we're in a park. Location is still park. It is in bare soil, and there are no wires. Fifteen. Okay. And land ratio? Fifty. Fifty five zero. Yes. And condition is pretty good. Yeah, good to fair. Any um, comments? No. no. <laughs> okay, so now you have an idea on how to map a tree. This is some of the equipment that you're going to be needing when you're out in the field. Each team will have a set of equipment, so no need to bring any of this with you. Um, besides your t-shirt. T-shirt number one, you'll be getting a Citizen Forester t-shirt. That's going to be really helpful for vis visibility and for looking coordinated as a team. Our team leaders will be providing everything else, which will come down to the clipboard to write out all the information that we're going to be collecting in the field. The DSH tape, which is the tape we're going to use to collect the diameter measurement. A hundred foot measuring tape, which is used for crown spread and um, for a couple of other things that we'll touch on in the field. The hypsometer is the device that we'll use um, for collecting the height information of trees. And also some handouts will be available to hand out to any community members that may stop and ask what it is that you're doing. So let's hop into some more information about each of the tree assessments that you're gonna be taking out in the field. The crown measurements, as I had mentioned before, we do have a couple of different assessments that we're going to be taking. The crown spread, live crown ratio, density, and dieback. So the crown spread is going to be the um, two measurements of the spread of the tree. So those two measurements are going to be perpendicular on one of the longest ends of the tree's crown, and then the cross section um, on the other side here. So that would be like these two lines of the tree. Next up is the live crown ratio. So again, we're looking to see how much of the tree is leaves compared to the whole height. So this little shaka here is a little trick we'll teach you out in the field that you can line your hand up with your tree. Your hand is gonna serve as the whole tree and each finger is gonna be a portion of the ratio. So say your knuckle, your uh, pointer finger knuckle will be about half, your middle finger will be about a third, and your ring finger here would be about a quarter. Next up, we have density. We're gonna collect that measurement by standing underneath the tree and looking up to see how much light's coming through the leaves. Die back, you also will take from standing underneath the canopy and taking a look around the edges to see how much um, of those branches are dying backwards towards the center of the tree. For all these measurements, again, you wanna take your best estimate at the time of measurement. Trees change throughout the seasons, as I'm sure you've observed in your own neighborhood. But when you're out in the field, you wanna take all of these measurements to your best observations at the time that you're in the field. Next up, we have condition. So condition is rated either good, fair, or poor. And we rate the condition of a tree based on the canopy method. So it's not um, going to reflect anything that you might see on the branches or the stem or the trunk of the tree. If you see any damage there, that's always good to know. But the general condition of the tree is going to be based off of the canopy alone. And this is because the canopy is what generates all of the food for the tree and supplies all of the energy for the tree also. So we're going to be looking for any abnormalities in leaf color. Sometimes yellowing is a sign of nutrition deficiency. Leaf size and density kind of go hand in hand if the tree is not getting enough nutrients um, or 
Water that it needs to grow healthy sized leaves. Dieback is a huge indicator of tree condition. So usually if there's a lot of dieback, the tree is not in good shape. And also water sprout growth or sucker growth. So when you see those new shoots growing out of a tree, that's usually because the tree is stressed or has been damaged. Okay. Measuring DSH is one of our very important um, measurements that we're gonna be taking when we're out in the field. This is one of the main measurements that we're taking that will calculate the ecological benefits of the trees as well. So let's take a look on how to accurately measure DSH. We are going to measure DSH. DSH stands for diameter at standard height. And that standard height is four and a half feet. So in order to keep track of that, we are going to use our DSH pins. Um, which we'll provide to you at the program. Um, you can place it on your shirt, on your hat, wherever four and a half feet falls on you. And if four and a half feet is in a place like eye level, or your nose, uh, feel free just to wear the button for fun. But so we'll find where four and a half feet lies on everybody. Um, the DSH tape, this is the, the tool that we're going to use to get this measurement. It has two sides to this tape. One is um, a regular inch. And the back side is a specially um, designated tape that is much larger than a regular size inch. And this is the calculation of diameter already measured out onto the size of the tape. This is the side of the tape that you're usually going to be using when measuring DSH. However, for getting that four and a half feet measurement on your own body, we'll use the, inch, the regular inch side. So I'll take the tape line it up to about where four and a half feet lies on me and then I would compare this height to the height on the tree uh, where I'm going to take my DSH measurement. So DSH tape has a little hook on the end so typically you could um, clip this in around the bark. This is a smooth bark tree so I might have to have an extra hand to hold on to this side but using the big side of the DSH tape um, that has a diameter equivalent of circumference already calculated. I will take this around the tree. Give the tree a nice big hug because we're tree huggers here, let's be honest. And if you take a close look, the end of the DSH tape has a little arrow here. Where the arrow end is where you're gonna take that measurement. Um, so the arrow kind of ends up on this tree in between 14 and 15. In this case, we're going to round. We're never gonna do um, fraction numbers, if the DSH falls underneath half of an inch, we'll round down. So here we'll round down to 14. If it was above half of an inch, we would round up to 15. And that's what we would record in our inventory for DSH for this tree. So this tree is an example of a more commonly seen community tree where it's not growing straight from the ground. It's got epiphytes and suckers growing out of it. That's gonna make taking the DSH a little bit more of a challenge, but we can still get the measurement that we need to see what the diameter of this tree is. So there are two options for taking the diameter standard height of a multi-stem tree. You can take it at an area that best represents the overall diameter. So if I were to take it underneath the split of this tree, um, right about here at Two feet or so under um, from ground level would be a good representation of DSH, and I would just take this measurement around the tree. So that's one option. The second option and the more accurate measurement is going to be still at four and a half feet of each of these stems. So we're going to take measurement of stem one and stem two, um, trying to get around the tree as close as I can. there would be our measurement. So trying not to get the um, epiphytes or anything growing underneath that tape, you wanna be as close to the bark as you can. Um, and you would do it for each of these stems, one and two, input those numbers into tree plotter and tree plotter would do the calculation of the complete diameter of this tree. Okay, so one more thing to note. Palm trees have a few exceptions that we want to touch on before getting out into the field. You don't have to memorize all of these standardizations. 
right now, um, as you practice measuring palm trees, they'll come over time. But just something to remember that there are standards for palm trees that are a little bit different than your other trees. So this is going to be live ground ratio is going to be one of those exceptions where it's always going to be at 25%. So remember that shaka, palm trees are always going to be that first option of 25%. Density is always going to be zero to 25. There's a lot of light that comes through those palm trees. And um, so we'll start with the first option of density at zero to 25. And the last exception for palm trees is going to be height. So usually when we're measuring height on trees, we start at the very bottom and measure the very top branch. However, for palm trees, because of the way that they develop and their ecological composition, they're a little bit different than standard trees. So we're actually going to take the height of a tree at the bottom of the palm fronds here. Um, so it's not the bottom of the fringe. It's, um, this is a manila palm, which will have that clean part to the shaft here. This is still part of the frond. So we're gonna actually take the height measurement of a tree like this right underneath that green portion. So where the green turns into brown trunk. Coconut palms won't have that green um, part of the frond. So wherever you start to see that transition between green and brown is where you're gonna to wanna to take the height measurement of palm trees. So next up is location information. This information is a little bit different than the assessments that we've already been covering, but they are still very important to be able to capture this information when recording our inventory for our city managers. The Citizen Forester Program primarily collects information on public trees. So we're gonna be looking at trees that are planted in city, county, and state properties. These types of areas can include parks or public right-of-ways. So that little easement between the street and your house, that's considered um, a public right-of-way. These are a variety of different types of growth spaces that trees can grow in in our public areas. Tree Potter, our inventory software, has each of these as options for being able to record how the tree is growing in that space. So trees can either be growing in a planting strip, that little strip of grass between a road and a sidewalk, a median, a median in the middle of a highway. An unimproved sidewalk is going to be that easement in between the street and somebody's property line, like their fence that doesn't have a cement sidewalk nearby. Also, you can find trees in tree wells, which are those square cutouts that are in sidewalks. Or in a park, trees can be planted in just bare soil. Okay, so next up is tree species identification. So this is one of my favorite parts about the program because you get to learn about the variety of different types of tree species that we have out in our, in our communities. So you're not expected to be an expert in tree species right off the jump. We do have resources that will help you when you're out in the field to identify your new tree friend. So we have pocket tree IDs that you can recommend you saving um, as a bookmark on your phone, so you can use it when you're out in the field. Um, feel free to look through this on your own time so you can get familiar with the variety of different tree species that you may encounter when you're out in the field or walking around your community. Okay, so trees are like people in a way where they have some similarities, they have some differences, but the more that you get to know them and see the different characteristics that set people and trees apart, the easier it is to tell the difference of who's who. So we're gonna review some observation skills to help you see those different types of characteristics that are gonna help to differentiate different types of tree species. So some of the things that we can look at when we are observing new tree species is the leaf morphology, how the, the leaf is growing, um, the orientation of the leaf and the shape, also, the shape of the crown um, can kind of be distinctive between different species. And also the bark type. Bark type is something that we um, can observe to see if it's a smooth bark, rough bark, peeling bark. Some of those characteristics are very um, specific to specific species of trees. 
Okay, so to help understand a little bit more about where our trees are coming from, we can group them together um, based on um, where they come from or purposes that they've had in our culture. So first we'll cover native trees that can be found um, in Hawaii and Guam. Um, native trees are gonna be trees that have arrived um, without human intervention. So just by nature alone, and they're usually transported by either wind, water, or wings, if you wanna use the three Ws. Um, so birds that transport seeds or plant material that will propagate um, on its own. So these um, difference between indigenous and endemic is also where a native tree can be native to more than one place. An endemic is just when that tree species is um, existing in just one geographic location. We also have Polynesian introduced plants or canoe plants. And this is going to be trees or plant material that was brought over by Polynesian voyagers um, to be used for food, medicine, clothing, building, um, spiritual or cultural significant reasons. And those trees have taken up um, a great value within our culture as well. Introduced plants are gonna be species that have been introduced to an area because of human intervention. So kind of like the Polynesian introduced plants, these plants have been introduced to an area intentionally by humans. And most of these trees that we are going to see um, are going to be post-European introductions. And then we have invasive species. These are trees that have also arrived in a geographic location because of human intervention. But these classify a little bit differently because of the impact that they have into their new environment. It's not always such a positive thing. So they're usually non-native or alien species to a new ecosystem and in some way they cause harm. So these species are not bad in and of themselves. They probably do have value to the area that they're native um, or even other areas, but in some ecosystems, they do provide some undesirable effects that make them a threat to the native environment and create um, some type of harm. Here in Hawaii, one of the ways that we can evaluate um, whether a tree is invasive or not is by a weed risk assessment. And this is a scale to evaluate the weediness of a tree. So the scale goes up to 14. This is something that we can find within tree plotter for some of our species. When you type in your common name for a species, the weed risk assessment score can populate and let you know if the tree that you have been inventorying is um, a high risk tree or a low risk tree. You can also find information on a specific species on your own research, if you go to plantpono.org, um, this is the organization that has created this weed risk assessment scale, and they have a collection of all the different species and their ratings on their site. Okay, so for this program, we record tree names by common name. You can also look up tree species by their scientific names as well. Um, but just for ease of use, we mostly use common names. So if you're looking up um, this particular species, you could use its scientific name, or you can search just by mango or manga if you're in Guam. So we use common name because this is what our managing partners use. However, there are a variety of different common names that are accepted across many different cultures. And that doesn't mean that any of them are wrong if they're not one that we use more commonly with this program. So if you come across a tree that you don't know what it is, you've looked at your tree ID cards and you're just stumped, that's okay. It's totally fine to not know. Whenever you're in doubt, just mark the tree as unknown. This way we can go back later and look at these trees that we weren't quite sure what the species is and be able to update it um, with other resources on hand. 
So market tree is unknown. Take any guesses that you might have in the comments. You also wanna fill out an unidentifiable tree form. These are forms that your team leader is gonna have on hand that will prompt you to fill out some information about all those observation skills that we reviewed before. And also you wanna take photos. Photos are gonna be a huge help when looking back at these trees that we don't know what the species is and save us time for having to go back out into the field to take a look at those trees again. So take as many photos as you can and we'll, um, yeah, so take as many photos as you can. So some tips for getting good photos of your trees. The more detail you can provide, the better. So this is a good starting picture of a tree, but it's kind of hard to tell the specific characteristics of this particular species without a closer look. So take a photo like that, but you also want to take photos more um, zoomed in on things like the leaves, the flowers, and the seed pods. Having this additional detail is going to be a huge indicator of what type of species this is. And from this, we can tell that this tree is a milo tree. Okay, so now you've taken your assessments, you've identified your trees, now we have to compile our data. So all this information gets put into a software called Tree Plotter. And so we'll train our citizen foresters on how to record the data and how to input it into our online application. Something to note though, not all of our volunteers are active in data entry. So if this is something that doesn't appeal to you, don't worry about it. You might not even have to ever worry about doing data entry, but if this is your thing, talk to your team leaders and I'm sure that they would love to have help with putting in the data after the mapping session. So your data sheet is going to be your main reference when you're out in the field. This is gonna be all of the assessments that you're gonna be reporting about the trees and underneath is all the information that you're gonna be recording about the land information um, or the location information about the tree. So this serves as your core blueprint and um, as your reference to see what it is you're going to need to collect when you're out in the field. Tree Plotter, this is our online inventory system and which holds on to all of the information that we've collected for the program thus far. So in addition to storing all the data that we've collected, Tree Plotter has this really cool tool called iTree. Um, and so what this does is it takes all the information that we've collected and makes calculations about the monetary and ecological benefits of the trees. And so it provides these values from specific trees to a whole range of trees, depending on what you filter when you're in tree plotter. And this is a valuable uh, measurement to have because we're able to take these numeric values and present them to government leaders or funders to be able to quantify the benefits of our trees to help to kind of um, boost or support supporting our trees in a way that a lot of people understand better. So some of the ecological benefits that our trees provide and that tree plotter can compute include the gallons of runoff prevented, the amount of carbon each tree sequesters or avoids, um, the pollutants that are removed from the air, and, and much, much more. It goes on beyond just this list. So um, this is just a quick overview of some of the ecological benefits that we were able to calculate when completing the inventory for the area of Kailua. Okay. So when you're out in the field, volunteers will mostly be using their phones for data input. And usually it's just one volunteer that wants to do this task that will be collecting the data point for each tree. And so this person is going to want to know how to add a tree into tree plotter, move the tree if it's put into the wrong spot, delete a tree if we need to remove it, and to add a photo. So when you're out in the field and you come across that tree you don't know, or you see something peculiar that you want to record, you can add that photo right into tree plotter at the time that you're in the field. So let's take a look to see how you would use tree plotter. As part of module four, we want to make sure everyone's comfortable logging on in the field. 
Today I'm going to show you using my iPhone, but you can use any device with data, so a tablet or your smartphone. Anything works, this is my iPhone. I'm going to log on to my browser, so a browser window. I use Acostia, it's really cool, it plants trees every time I search for anything. Besides the point, we're going to type in the URL pg-cloud.com backslash Hawaii. So this is going to take you to our inventory every time. I guess this is the perfect time to mention that you should bookmark this page so you don't have to type that in every single time you're out in the field. Great, now that the page is loaded, you are looking at the first page of Oahu's tree inventory. So these little yellow dots are showing organizations or locations of where citizen foresters are currently mapping trees. We are gonna move through this as if you are out in the field mapping trees right now with your phone in your hand. So the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is log in. Head to those four lines up in the right corner Click and you're going to see a drop down menu. At the bottom of that drop down menu, there's a log in button. This side panel should appear and you're going to enter in your username and password. Everyone's username is going to be the first letter of their first name and their entire last name. So Shannon Rivera, my username is S Rivera quick detour to say that every citizen forester will get a login, so check with staff to confirm your username. Moving on, everyone will start with the same password. So it's important that the first time you log in, that you go into settings and change this password to something that only you know. Once you're logged in, you'll see your organization or the location that you're going to be mapping in. It's usually just one site unless you're mapping in multiple and then you'll see multiple. You can see that I map in multiple sites. I live in Honolulu City so I'm going to zoom into my location as if we're mapping near my house. The way I'm zooming in is the same way you would zoom in on a photo on your phone. You're just using your two fingers to pull yourself closer to the map and I'm going towards that yellow dot. Once I click on it, it shows me that that organization or my location is Urban Honolulu and I'm going to want to click Load Trees. Ooh, low battery, if you're like me, close out of that, let's disregard it. Okay, okay, probably a bad idea. This is actually a good teaching moment. You wanna make sure that your devices are charged before going out mapping because if they die, then everyone's gotta go home. You need a device to be able to map outside. Back to the tutorial, we're waiting for the trees to load in urban Honolulu. They should be popping up, there they are. Those are all of the trees that have currently been mapped in the urban Honolulu area. For this tutorial, we're not interested in the trees that have already been mapped. We're pretending as if we're in a new location mapping new trees. So we're gonna want to find our current location. On the left side menu, there's a GPS location finder. You're gonna click that and it's going to find your location. If you don't have location settings on for your browser, you might see this. You're gonna wanna click okay so the browser can find your location. If you don't see that window and you're not able to find your location, you're gonna to need to go into your phone's location settings and allow your browser to use your current location. If that doesn't make sense to you, go ahead and contact staff and we can try and help you out with that. Once I click okay, the site is going to find my location. Yep, that's actually pretty accurate. I am currently sitting in my apartment, downtown Honolulu. There I am. The next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is get rid of that halo around your location so we have a clearer view of the map. So again, you're just gonna go back over to that GPS toggle, press it, and it's going to be able to show you a clear map of your area. Let's say we're in a mapping group, we've walked across the street, and we wanna map this tree on the corner of Nu'uanu and Baratania. What are we gonna do? Well, my friends, I'll tell you. Exciting, we've come to our first real task of the day, and this is to add a tree. You're gonna to wanna to go back up to those four lines in your right corner of the screen. It's gonna pull up this, where you're going to click Add Tree. That's gonna take you to a window that shows you these options. For now, disregard the planting sites. We do map stumps, but for this exercise, we're mapping a tree, so click tree. You're now in add tree mode. Anywhere you click on this map, you are going to make a point, so be careful. You can no longer zoom in and out. You're going to want to make one dot on this map, and that's to map the tree. Your one touch will be in the area where the tree is. Estimate as best as you can. Once you click, voila, you've made your first point. 
the most important thing from this pop-up window is that primary ID number. You're gonna wanna tell whoever is recording on the data sheets this primary ID number so when your team leader goes back in, they can enter all of the correct information to the correct tree. And the way that we do that is knowing the primary ID number. As I scroll through, disregard this stuff for now, I'm gonna pause at staff member. This shows that you made the point, and this is helpful when we have any questions about if the tree is in a funny place or if it's accidentally been deleted, we can trace it back to that person. Further, down the list, there's an option where you can add photos. This is really important if you need to make any notes. Once you click on that, you can either take a photo right there or browse your photo library if you've already taken a photo from that tree. Scrolling back up to the top, we're gonna to wanna to click out of this window. We're done there. That's all you have to do while you're out in the field is get that primary ID number, maybe add some photos, and there is your first point. Be careful when you do this, you're still in add tree mode. If you click up at the top, you'll see that you can stop adding tree, which is what you're gonna to wanna to do if you wanna scroll around that map again. Let's say that once we've added this tree point, we want to move it to a more accurate location. Maybe you've made the point too close to the road, or maybe it's in a parking lot. We want to make sure that each point is as accurate as possible because they're tied to GPS markers on our map. And that's really important if anybody else wants to go back in and check up on this tree. Luckily, there is an option for that, and it's the move tree button in that drop down menu. We've went over how to add a tree and now we want to move a tree. So once you click move tree, yep, we're in move tree, you're going to click on that dot. You're going to need to re-click on that dot in order for the system to know that that's the dot that you want to move. Once you do that, it highlights in blue. The next time you click on your map, that is where your tree is going to move. So say we want to move this dot to the tree right next to it. I'm gonna click on that tree pop-up window is going to ask you if you want to move this point you're going to click yes it's going to ask if you want to update the address of this tree you're going to click yes so yes twice and that dot is going to move over to the most accurate location if you're really careful the first time you make a point most likely you won't need to move it what happens more often is you accidentally bump your screen when you're in add tree mode and you're going to need to delete certain points that you've put in a pool or in the middle of the street. So let's go ahead and delete the point that we created. Go ahead and click on that point. It's gonna pull up a window. You're going to go into the details. So click on details and up in the left corner of the next screen, there's a delete button. This is gonna delete any unwanted points you made by mistake. Have a lot of caution with this button. You do not wanna delete any points you did not make yourself. If and only if this point was made by mistake, go ahead and click yes, and that point will be deleted from the system. And look, we're back to square one. We don't wanna make points just to delete them though. The primary ID number gets deleted along with those trees and we can't reuse them. So biggest takeaway is be careful where you place those points. You wanna make them as accurate as possible. And don't worry, you'll have as much time as you need to practice. Once you're done with your session, you can click back up in the corner right of your screen, log out, and you're done with your session. Okay, so hopefully that helped get you more familiar with Tree Potter. So let's practice a little bit by going on to the inventory itself. If you type in this web page, pgcloud-hawaii, or if you're in Guam, it would be pgcloud.com slash Guam. And that would pull up the inventory for both locations. If you use the username and password on the screen, you'll be able to log in into the tree training organization and start playing around in there. Okay, and last but not least, the Citizen Forester program equips our volunteers as urban forestry ambassadors. And this just means advocating for trees. So we'll cover some helpful tips for interacting with the community as you're working out in the field as a citizen forester. As part of module one, becoming an urban forest ambassador, we have a section for interacting with the community. And yes, we are all about trees, but we work with urban trees. And so a really fun part of this program is getting to work and interact with the community as well. 
And we've actually found that our citizen foresters play an important role in the community. They become the voices of our trees and our cities and people look to them with certain questions when they wanna talk about trees. So for this section of module one, we're gonna go over some tips and tricks on how to best interact with the community. And many of our citizen foresters have actually said that chatting with the community is the best part of the program. So we wanna make sure all of our citizen foresters feel comfortable and safe when out in the field. So let's get started by sharing our first rule of thumb, and that's to always remember your outreach materials. If you have those informational brochures, you don't have to have every answer to every question, and you don't even have to be a talkative person. You can just pass along that literature and you're good to go. So definitely having literature is helpful, but you also have an opportunity to let people know why trees are important to you. So preparing your personal message is also a really important rule of thumb. Once you become a trained citizen forester working out in the field, you really become an authority figure and community members tune in a little bit more to listen to what you have to say. So this, again, is a really important time to know exactly what you want to share. And your message will be different depending on who you're talking to, right? Your message to a tourist might be very different than to somebody working or a business owner or maybe a resident that's walking their dog or even children out in the field. You'll want to make sure that you have pitches for each person you're addressing. Just like we know, no two people are the same. No two days out in the field are going to be the same either. Again, and that's a fun part of this program, you don't know who you're going to meet and what conversations you're going to have. But we do have some tips and tricks to share to better equip you when you're out chatting with your neighbors. Our first tip, make a plan. Every time you meet up with a citizen forester group out in the field, you should check in with each other to assess and make a plan. You want to assess your safety first and foremost, so have a plan in place with your team in case you need to leave a situation, if you feel uncomfortable in any way, or if you just don't feel talkative and want someone else to take over. We rarely have any problems with our interactions, but just in case, you want to make sure you have that plan in place and report any situation that you felt uncomfortable with. Tip 2. It's okay not to know. You'll actually be surprised. People will have a lot of questions about trees and you are under no obligation to have the answers to that. You don't need to try to answer and it's probably better if you don't because you might be giving them the wrong information. So just pass along that brochure. Say, I'm not sure, but you can check out these websites or these phone numbers to get the right answer. Tip three, and hold on to your seats. Not everyone likes trees. And I know that sounds crazy, but sometimes that's true. And it may be a good opportunity to share why trees should be loved, but if you're dealing with someone who's looking to stay unhappy, it's probably best to leave the conversation, maybe the location, map a different tree, and report any abnormal interactions to your team leader. Now for our fourth and final tip, that is to practice your pitch. Every time you go out into the community as a citizen forester, you are an urban forest ambassador, so you want to make sure you make it count. Now for some final reminders for this section. Remember to always report any unusual activities, any unusual interactions. We want to make sure we have your back if anything were to come up. And remember, while in the field as a citizen forester, you're representing the program, so make us proud. So no picking mangoes, no fighting people who don't like trees. You always want to remain professional and we have no doubt that you'll do that. Take your time going through the rest of this module. We have a lot of frequently asked questions and example responses. And remember, practice makes perfect. See you next time. So as we're out in the field, people often see us working together as a group with their yellow shirts. I want to know what it is that you're doing. So a good response to that would be we're volunteers collecting information on our public trees for an inventory. And this information that we're collecting will help the people that take care of these trees better manage our urban forest. Easy and simple. Now, sometimes people have a tree or have a question about a tree and you're not expected to know all the answers. On the handout material that your team leaders will have either as a flyer handout or as a QR code, those resources are gonna be available to give out to the community for more information. And those brochures have information about phone numbers um, that are gonna be more specific to some community members' concerns. Some safety points to make before we wrap up here. 
Um, but since we are working out in public spaces, there are a ton of things that we might be encountering, whether it's stray animals, road construction, traffic. These are all things that we want to be mindful of when we're out in the field. And like I had said earlier, citizen forester safety is always number one. So if you ever see something that you're uncomfortable with or that might be questionable, it's best to just err on the side of safety and work together as your team. Given us the age of COVID-19, there are some precautions that we need to take now. You probably already completed your COVID-19 waiver to participate in the program, but when you're out in the field, there's a few more asks that uh, we may require, depending on your local ordinances at the time. So generally, we'll ask you to wear a mask. This is not always required, but check in with your team leader, leader to see if it is required at the time of your participation. Our team leaders will sanitize equipment just for that extra safety precaution. And of course, if you're not feeling well, don't come that week. We'll see you next time. With any type of environmental initiative or program, there's more to it than just what we're working on. So there's more going on than just the trees that we're looking at, right? So there are a few other organizations that we partner with that we like to be aware of and mindful of when we're out in the field to see um, if we can be eyes and ears to help those organizations as well. So one of them being coconut rhinoceros beetles. These are a really bad pests um, that burrow into palm trees. And um, there's, more info there's some information in your manual about um, CRB or coconut rhinoceros beetles and how to identify them. Usually we work with the CRB response team once a year to do a webinar on how to identify CRB damage on palms. Also rapid ohia death. Oftentimes we don't find ohia trees in our public environments, but you or a friend may have an ohia tree growing in their yard. Um, and these are some helpful hints to help to reduce the transmission of um, RD. Also, if you're on Oahu, um, you can be mindful of Manuoku. And they are one of Oahu's um, native endangered birds. So if you see one of these birds nesting, there is some information about how you can report that. Some of the things to note about the program, the Citizen Forester Program is involved with schools. We have partnered with the Moliwai Initiative to help create a Citizen Forester Program um, curriculum that can be um, implemented into school curriculum. So we work with schools in this way, and also we do work with some other schools with mapping and inventorying and teaching about the benefits of trees. So, all that to say, we'll come back to one of my favorite friends, the Lorax. Um, he has a couple of awesome quotes, but this one is one of my favorites. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. So with that, we wanna thank you for taking the time to learn about the Citizen Forester Program and what's involved in being a volunteer with us and doing your part to protect our urban forests. So to solidify your skills as a Citizen Forester, like I said at the beginning, you're really gonna hone in on all of these skills when you're out in the field doing training. So check in with your local coordinator to see when your next infield training is, or the next time that you can get out into the field to join a volunteer session. And we can help support you in getting more comfortable with your assessment skills and tree identification skills out in the field. To be a certified citizen forester, we ask that you complete this infield training as we are gonna break down the skills that you need and break down the assessments so you can really learn the why and the how behind each of them. Um, you'll also receive your certificate and your t-shirt um, at your first supported mapping session. And after um, we feel comfortable that you can go out into the field as a certified citizen forester. So with that, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your coordinator. Our contact information will be in the comment section of this video. Um, and with that, aloha, happy tree hugging.